This video is made possible by Practical Defense Systems, the best online security training at the lowest prices. You can start your security career today online at pdsclasses.com. Check them out. Hi, this is Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for watching Gun Guy TV and all of the support that you give me. I'm very, very grateful for what you do. I have a fantastic interview today with Dan O'Kelly, who's a retired special uh, agent with the ATF. And no, you don't have to automatically hate Dan. He's a very nice man, and he does a great job, and he's very pro-Second Amendment. In fact, he has a website I want to show to you now, if I may. And that is at gunlearn.com. So I urge you to check that out because he spends a lot of time educating people on what the law really is, not necessarily how it is applied. Now, I say that, and I don't mean it to sound uh, terribly negative. So first of all, let me get you that website so you can take a look at it. I don't want to imply that law enforcement runs around intentionally trying to apply laws in an, in an incorrect way, because I don't believe that's true with the majority of law enforcement. But nevertheless, sometimes the government does go sideways, and they apply things in ways that don't make sense. And currently, Dan has, uh, he's in kind of the middle of something uh, that you may want to see as well. So let me show you that. There's an article in, on the CNN website. In, in, uh, it's entitled, Former ATF Agent at Center of Legal Dispute over AR-15. Now, Dan and I have talked about this a number of times. I want to uh, want to give him an opportunity to explain what that's all about and how it may affect you. So, Dan, thank you very much for coming on the show. I'm very grateful. Thank you for having me. Why don't you tell us what the heck is going on? I, you know, as my as my viewers already know, I'm sick as a dog, so I'm going to shut up and let you talk. Okay. Well, simply, um, if that can be done, there are four definitions of a firearm in federal law. The first one is the one everyone's familiar with, and that is any weapon which expels a projectile by the action of an explosive. Um, the second one is the frame or receiver of any firearm is also a firearm. And that's where we come into this problem. There's a definition of frame or receiver in federal law. It's found in chapter 27 of the Code of Federal Regulations. And that definition calls for four elements. Something has to have these four elements in order to be a firearm frame and therefore be a firearm. Well, the AR-15 lower only has two of those elements. Those elements are the definition says uh, the item has to house the hammer. It has to house a bolt or breech block, depending on which one the firearm has. It has to house the firing mechanism, and then it has to receive the barrel. Although, granted, the definition says and usually is threaded at its forward portion to receive the barrel. It's not that well written. But four elements. Now, of those four elements, how many does an AR-15 lower have? Well, it houses the hammer, and it houses the firing mechanism. Does an AR-15 lower house a bolt or breech block? Of course not. The bolt in an AR-15 is in the upper receiver, which isn't regulated in any way. And the lower of an AR-15 doesn't receive the barrel in any way. So out of those two elements, an AR-15 lower only satisfies two of them, uh, those four elements. And therefore, when I was first asked that in 2014 in a federal case, I told the truth. No, it's not a firearm receiver because it doesn't satisfy the definition. Well, that has gained traction over the last five years because I've been asked as a result of that case to repeat that fact in several other cases. And in December, two months ago, a federal judge in Ohio, we finally reached the point where this federal judge, Judge Carr, uh, agreed. He said, no, this doesn't match. Uh, this is a ridiculous situation. I'm paraphrasing, basically, but he dropped the charges against two people. And, uh, you know, it's reached the point now where, well, what do we do from here? Well, and that begs a question. Um, I'd like to ask the question, what do we do from here? But I'd also like to ask how we got here in the first place. If this has been the case since day one, that an AR-15 lower did not meet the requirements under federal law to be considered a firearm, 
How did we end up in this position in the first place where it's been treated like a firearm for all these decades? Well, step one is the fact that the United States is the only country in the world that produces firearms and considers a receiver to be a firearm by itself. Every other gun producing country in the world considers a barrel to be a firearm and or considers a bolt slash breech block to be a firearm because those are the two components, of course, that are required to fire a cartridge. Uh, some of the officials in these other countries laugh at the United States because we regulate these receivers. You know, think about it. If you had a box of ammunition and a receiver, what are you going to do with those? You can't make it fire a cartridge. Uh, so that was step one. The United States adopted that principle. And step two was when AR-15 semi-automatics first made the U.S. market, the commercial market, uh, the question was, well, what part of this rifle is going to be considered the receiver? And there's an ATF internal letter. It's out there on the internet. Um, it's in several of these recent articles if you wanted to see a copy of it. But ATF officials were asking each other, what are we going to consider the receiver on this AR-15? Because it has an upper and a lower. And the letter says, well, granted, no part of the firearm satisfies the definition, but the lower is closest. So we're going to consider that the receiver and move forward. And, you know, I can only laugh at that. Uh, close, you know, the saying about close, only, you know, horseshoes, horseshoes and hand grenades. grenades right. right. I mean, <laughs> horseshoes it, and it either grenades. is or it isn't. Right. But yet somebody in ATF back then in 1971, we're going on, you know, next year will be the 50th anniversary of that big decision. Uh, for the last 50 years, they've treated the lower as a firearm frame, and they have uh, required people who make them to get a license. If they find somebody making them and selling them uh, or transporting them across state lines without a license, you know, they get sanctioned civilly, criminally. Uh, anybody who's prohibited from possessing a firearm uh, found in possession of one of these lowers, has been prosecuted. Uh, no doubt there are people in prison today for one or both of those violations. And I'm not for a minute going to say that, you know, prohibited people shouldn't have, should have firearms. I'm not saying that. There, there have to be definitions and there have to be uh, rules against proven bad people from having guns. However, a definition says what it says. Let's look at, for a second, the first definition of a firearm, any weapon which expels a projectile by the action of an explosive. The same reason is why flare guns are not firearms. They expel a projectile and they use an explosive, but they weren't designed as weapons, so they don't qualify. One of the elements in the definition is missing. Uh, same thing with a BB gun, you know, you, or a pellet gun. You may call it a weapon, and it does expel a projectile, but it doesn't use an explosive. It uses air, a spring, CO2, whatever. So you have to have all three or four whatever elements are in a definition before an item can have that definition applied to it and fall within it. And uh, as a result, the lower of an AR-15, uh, what ATF calls the frame of a Glock pistol, the upper of an FAL rifle, the upper of an Uzi, a Tommy gun, uh, the frame of almost every semi-automatic pistol on the market, no matter who makes it, only has between one, two, maybe three of these elements and does not qualify if you apply the law in a fair way. Well, this really opens up a huge can of worms, doesn't it? It certainly does. Where do we go from here? Well... The government is either going to have to rewrite the definition or stop enforcing the manufacture and possession of mere frames. I doubt that's going to happen. So they're going to have to change the definition. Okay, but in the meantime, how many cases over the last 50 years have been adjudicated based upon that definition? And if it's determined to have been erroneous all that time, doesn't that open up an opportunity for attorneys to go back and relitigate? All of that? Certainly. This is an earthquake in the, uh, in the gun industry and in federal gun law because it has a huge ripple effect. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned in that CNN article, 
you know, every time this comes up in one of these cases where I've been asked to testify, it's like kill the messenger and the uh, the news refers to this as my opinion or my decision or my, you know, like I'm on some crusade. You know, I retired from ATF in 2011 and it wasn't until three years later in 2014 when an attorney hired me to be an expert witness in a case that he was litigating. Uh, he called me and he said, can you make a determination for us as to whether an item is a firearm or not? Well, sure, that's what I do. Send me the item, send me a copy of the report. And this was the Aries Armor case out of San Diego involving Dimitri Karras. Uh, I looked at this thing, it was one of these 80% uh, polymer AR lowers, and it had dimpling on the side, which ATF calls indexing. ATF has long held that even an 80% receiver, if it is dimpled or indexed in their words to show where the remaining steps are to be drilled then they consider that the same as having done those steps already and they say that the item is already a firearm you you've gone the whole route well i looked at this thing i'm on the phone with that attorney and i said well he wanted to talk about the indexing issue and argue that i said let me take this a step further forget indexing i said even if you finish this thing if you drill the holes and complete it in every way. I said it still only satisfies half the definition of a firearm receiver. Therefore, how can it be a frame? Therefore, how can it be a firearm? He says, what? I said, well, bring up, and I cited the definition and where it's found in the law, and you hear him typing it in. Uh, he's reading it. I said, look, it only, even a complete finished one only does two of these four things. And it was funny. He, he got all animated. He said, can you put that in writing? I, I started laughing. I said, it's in writing. You're reading it. So, you know, this has existed all along since the Gun Control Act was written. Uh, I'm not an attorney, obviously. I may be wrong on the exactly when this definition was written, if it coincided with the 1968 Gun Control Act, but it's been a long time. And uh, so I basically pointed out the fact that, hey, here are four elements in this definition, and this item only has two of them. Anybody could have done that. So the uh, next thing you know, ATF returned 6,000 of these polymer 80% lowers to Dimitri Karras in that civil case. Um, a year later, the Jimenez case came up in Oakland, California. I pointed the same thing out for that attorney. Uh, as a result, the attorney general, Loretta Lynch at the time was the attorney general of the United States. She wrote a letter to Congress saying, hey, uh, this is not right. You know, you need to tell ATF they need to fix this or you need to fix it, you being Congress. And uh, that was in 2015 and nothing's been done. And from what I'm hearing uh, from my sources, ATF has no intent to change this. Well, unless they're forced to, I, and I think that's the, that's the question at this point, if this keeps popping up in court, eventually this thing's going to end up before a, an appellate court. And at some point, you never know, it could end up at the Supreme court. If something like that happens, it's going to create, I, I, you know, I'm listening to you talk and I'm envisioning the nuclear explosion happening where the law is concerned right. and everything being wiped out past, present and future unless Congress goes back and changes the law. The problem is Congress is just a big collection of committees. You know, the old saying is a camel is nothing but a horse that was created by a committee. So I'm not envisioning them acting very quickly to make an actual functional correction to this. So where does that leave the, the average gun owner at this point? Well, Judge Carr in the Northern District of Ohio has already ruled that these things are not receivers not therefore not firearms. So as far as Northern Ohio right now, uh, if a person were to start cranking these out without a license left and right, and ATF came in and arrested the guy and took him to federal court, it's going to be in front of Judge Carr. And we already know what his position is on this. He's going to dismiss the case uh, and find these not to be firearms. So you know, again, I'm not an attorney, but that would tend to indicate that at least in northern Ohio, you know, you can do whatever you want with an AR-15 lower now because of ATF's uh, lack of activity 
after the attorney general notified them five years ago that this needed to be corrected. And that same situation can, you know, have a domino effect across the country. And I expect it will soon. I'm envisioning now all the for sale signs in California, New York, and so on, as people move to Northern Ohio, uh, you know, that's that kind of stuff happens, right? Uh, so the, the clarification I want to make though, is that this, we're talking about federal law, not Correct. state law. States have their own laws and those laws are often different than federal statutes. So does this distinction affect the laws that states can pass or have passed with regard to firearms that fall within this category? Well, every state obviously has its own gun laws. And as we teach in our seminars, state laws, state definitions concerning guns generally mirror federal law. If you, once you know the federal definitions, uh, if you look at your state's definition, let's say you look up the definition of a rifle, well, you'll see that your state's definition of a rifle is basically the same verbiage as the federal definition, and then they tweak it a little bit. In most states, they either put it down exactly. Uh, if they're an anti-gun state, then they make it a little tighter, more restrictive. Um, so, yeah, these state laws are already in effect. Um, on the other hand, even though, let's say in northern Ohio, Judge Carr has already ruled that federally these AR lowers are not firearms. If someone was found making them without a license or possessing them, you know, being a prohibited person in northern Ohio, and the court case went to a state court, the case went to a state court, well, the state judge and prosecutor and defense attorney, they would be dealing with the Ohio state definition of a firearm. And, uh, you know, I don't keep up with all the state definitions and laws because there are obviously 50 of them and they change continually. It's enough to keep up with federal law, which is what we do. Uh, but in that state case, let's say the definition of a firearm frame or receiver is the exact same as it is federally. Well, you're going to have the same result, most likely in that state court. However, if the state definition says uh, you know, a firearm is any weapon that expels a projectile by the action of an explosive and it doesn't go any farther, then there's no state regulation on frames or receivers to begin with in that state. You have to look at what the definitions are and how many they have and do, do any of them apply to this item that we're talking about. This is really an example, I think, of how lawmakers make laws with a million holes in them or they make laws that don't necessarily apply to the real world, and then law enforcement is is uh, put in the task of taking them and applying them in some fashion to try to enforce laws. I was just thinking about the, the patchwork of states passing laws to try to overcome this, and the nightmarish collection of laws that um, that Americans would have to function under because each state legislature is going to try to, is, again, we're back to the camel created by a committee trying to create laws that are going to function, none of which are going to be quite functional. So this strikes me as a disaster in the making in many respects, in some ways perhaps positive for gun owners, but in some ways maybe not. What, what's your view on that? Well, if ATF changes or the federal government, Congress, whatever entity you want to refer to, if they change the definition eventually, um, simplest way it seems to change it would be to change the word and in the present definition to the word or. And then any item which houses the hammer or houses the bolt of reach block or houses the firing mechanism or receives the barrel would be a, a receiver and therefore a firearm. But that would then make, for instance, with an AR-15, the upper would also be a, a firearm. So an AR-15 would have two receivers. The uppers would have to, you know, any receivers made after that point, would the uppers would have to be serialized. You'd have to fill out a 4473 when you buy one. Um, I don't see that as a huge problem because, for starters, you can't make a retroactive law. You can't make an ex post facto law. All the... AR-15 uppers that are already in existence, even though they would be considered firearms after that point, they would not have to have serial numbers. Just like 
prior to the Gun Control Act in 68, 22 rimfire rifles and shotguns did not have to have serial numbers. You'll still see, you know, some uh, 50 or more year old shotgun or 22 rifle that doesn't have a serial number, never had one. They're legal to possess. Uh, that's the way these uppers would be treated. It's just that any made after that point would have to have a serial number. Uh, what's funny to me is a lot of what I see comments being made on social media as a result of the CNN article. Uh, you know, when you see the guy who says, well, what kind of an expert is this guy? Uh, of course, these things are, these lowers, these AR-15 lowers are receivers. They have serial numbers on them. <laughs> and it's like, uh, okay. I think you're getting the chicken in front of the egg there, buddy. The reason they have a serial is because ATF told the person who made it, we consider it a receiver. And if you don't put a serial number on it, we're going to bust you. Well, now ATF's been held, you know, had their feet held to the fire on that issue. It's an interesting, you know, it's interesting you say that you can't make a retroactive law. And, and yet, I'm sitting here noodling on it because I know being, where you're going and not being an attorney or whatever. Well, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. And yet in States like California, they go back and say, Oh, by the way, any of these guns that you made, these 80% lowers, if you want them to be legal, you have to go back and now put serial numbers on them. If they're going to be legal in the state, otherwise you're going to take them and get them out of the state. And so if I don't know where that rule, if it is one that says you cannot make a, a law that is then retroactive actually is codified, but it does not seem to be, um, it doesn't seem to be held as a standard for state laws in some states, or am I, am I somehow getting myself all screwed up here? Well, again, I'm not an attorney and I could be the, right. a little bit off on that, but the concept of an ex post facto law uh, is something I remember being taught. And where I thought you were going with that is the, the issue with the bump stocks that originally ATF said, okay, these things are legal. Now they say they're machine guns. That wasn't done through an ex post facto law. That was done by them redefining what the word automatically means, not to get off on a tangent. But in the definition of a machine gun, the word automatically exists. All they did was go back and say, okay, what does this word mean? And they decided to, I'm using air quotes here. I hate to do that, but they <laughs> said now the you. word <laughs> now the word automatically means exactly what these stocks do. So hey, abracadabra, they're machine guns. Uh, that wasn't an ex post facto law. I'm not sure how the states are doing what you're referring to. I could be wrong on that. I'm not sure the bump stock thing is going to survive constitutional muster either for that reason. But I, you I know, not so. being an attorney. I don't know. What other effects do you think this is going to have other than the monstrous ones we've already talked about? If, if this definition, which is actually the accurate definition, continues and Congress does not go back and update the law because of the fact that Congress oftentimes is a, an exercise in a lot of spit and vinegar, but nothing gets accomplished. If that happens, how does that how does that affect where we go from here and the enforcement of this type of law where receivers are concerned? Because we're not talking about, from what you're describing, we're not just talking about AR-15s. We're talking about pistol uh, lowers, receivers. Well, you know, you're talking about pistols. You take the slide off and take everything else. What do you got? You got the frame. That's it. Well, if the frame doesn't house all those things, the frame is not a firearm either, and yet it's serialized. So where does that take us, and how huge a problem is this? for ATF from an enforcement perspective? Well, it depends on how the definition gets rewritten. If the definition gets rewritten merely by saying, okay, let's change the word and to the word or, then again, an upper is a firearm frame and a lower is a firearm frame because these are all pieces which do one or more of these four elements. Um, on the other hand, it could also result in what our presently considered dummy guns. If you're familiar with display type guns, uh, they are not, basically it's a parts kit put on a fake receiver. The receiver does not qualify because it doesn't have any of those four elements. Well, if they rewrite the definition, you could have a situation where some of these display or dummy guns are now considered firearms because the receiver is a firearm. Um, it just depends on where they go with this definition. 
Wow. <laughs> I wish I had some more articulate response. But uh, like I say, this is wow. sort of an earthquake. Now, the article did not refer to an actual court case. So it might be interesting for people to go read that article. I'll put it back up on the screen again. Um, it didn't refer to a court case. So I, there's the article for you. It's on CNN's website. And if I, if my brain works today, right now I'm kind of sick, so I think I only have one brain cell that's functioning properly, but I will try to put it in the description for you so that you can find it and read it. I suggest you do so. What, what prompted them to write this article, do you think? Well, actually it was, a, it was several court cases. Um, the Aries Armor thing was in 2014 where the San Diego attorney asked me that first time about this indexing and I brought up, hey, even a complete lower doesn't satisfy the definition. Uh, that word of, you know, the ripple effect from that case got out there in lawyerdom. And uh, a year later, a federal public defender in Oakland, California, in the Jimenez case, again, he asked my opinion. Uh, his client was then, uh, his case was dismissed because that's all the client had is one of these receiver lowers, so to speak. And uh, the case was thrown out. Based on that, another attorney uh, asked for my, you know, asked for me to repeat what I said. And again, your plumber could repeat this fact that, hey, here are the four elements and here's what this item has or doesn't have. But uh, they asked me to repeat what I had said in the prior two. That was the Joseph Rowe case. Uh, in Orange County, California, and uh, Joseph Rowe, I know him, he's a great guy, just a, just seriously, a, a nice gentleman, no prior criminal history. Uh, he had one of these clubs going where uh, he had a CNC machine, he would join the club, bring in an 80% lower, and uh, he would instruct you on how to put your 80 percenter in the machine and hit the go button. And I remember that guy. Later, yeah, yeah, I remember that case. Well, it was complete. Well, he, that judge wrote an off the record opinion after I testified, uh, the judge wrote an off the record opinion that, Hey, these things don't appear to be receivers. They don't appear to match the definition. And before he could render that opinion, the government then offered a sweetheart deal to Mr. Rowe and said, look, if you plead guilty to this felony, the way this will work is we'll make a deal. You'll be a convicted felon for one year. At the end of a year, it gets expunged. You're no longer a convicted felon. It's all over with. But we win today and you win a year from now. And what that did is preempt the judge from having to render the opinion that, hey, these AR lowers aren't receivers. Uh, as a result of that court case, CNN wrote their first article back uh, two months ago, two or three months ago, I think maybe October. And uh, they exposed, you know, what had happened in the Roe case that the government had cut this sweetheart deal on a guy to protect gun control efforts. And uh, then after, shortly after that article aired, uh, that's when Judge Carr ruled on the case in Ohio in which I testified that was the Robeson and Rowald case. And uh, as a result of that case, the same CNN reporter, Scott Glover, wrote this most recent article that you're referring to that now this thing has snowballed to the point that, you know, a federal judge actually did render the opinion that these things aren't receivers and that, you know, this procedure that ATF has followed for 50 years is way off the reservation, et cetera. Are either of those cases on their way to appeal, or has the government simply let them go? I have not heard that they're on their way to appeal. Um, you understand why I'm asking? Fact, because it, I w it would make sense to me that the government would not want to appeal those because well, they're afraid the they're going to lose in a higher court. Well, when someone is convicted of something, found guilty, they can appeal. When you're found innocent, uh, there's a rule called double jeopardy. The they government can't. Can, ah. cannot bring that case again. So these guys in Ohio cannot be prosecuted again for that issue. So that cannot be appealed. They're off the hook, and uh, it is what it is. And the government's off the hook for continuing to prosecute people for a law that really isn't correct. 
It was kind of a shady thing for the prosecutors to do, but it doesn't surprise me in the one case you were talking about. Uh, you know, I guess everybody plays the game, so to speak, but uh, boy, that's pretty right. sad. Well, there you go. Anything else about this particular subject we should chat about? Well, the uh, issue that, you know, the rumblings I keep hearing is that ATF doesn't plan to do anything about this. So why I should they? That. Nobody's forcing them to at this point. Once they're forced to, they will. Right. What else you is know. going on with uh, with ATF and federal law at the moment that people ought to know about? If anything. Well, this this isn't the only issue that doesn't, you know, when you hold it up to the light, has holes in it. Um, you know, there's also the issue of you can't put a, ver a vertical foregrip on a handgun. Have you ever heard that? Yep. Federal law, you can't can't put a vertical foregrip on a handgun, even if it's an AR-15 handgun or a smaller, you know, a Glock. Right. Well, why is that? And this is sort of a funny situation. It's never made sense to me, so I don't know. Well, the definition of a pistol has three elements. It's a firearm that is designed to be held and fired in one hand. It has a chamber integral to the barrel, and it has a grip at an angle to the barrel. And when you put a vertical foregrip on a handgun, the reason that becomes an National Firearms Act, any other weapon, is not because that makes it any more capable of shooting people or anything. It's a default situation. Once you put a second grip on a handgun, it's no longer, quote, designed to be held and fired in one hand. Well, it's also not a rifle or a shotgun, and it's also not merely a firearm, like a Mossberg shockwave, for instance, is just a firearm. Yeah. So by default, the only place it lands is under the National Firearms Act in the any other weapon category. Well, here's the funny thing about that. Um, you can't have, a, according to ATF, a vertical foregrip on a handgun, right? Yeah. Because it would be an AOW. Well, have you ever looked at uh, a regular AR-15 pistol? What's that thing around the barrel, that horizontal foregrip? You know, look at an AK-47 pistol with the wooden thing around the barrel, that horizontal foregrip. And then when uh, Fab Defense came out with the thing that you can put on the magazine well of an AR-15 pistol that gives it finger grooves, ATF wrote them a letter and said, yeah, that's okay. Well, isn't that a vertical foregrip? And then there is the, uh, who's the company that made the angled foregrip? Uh, there's one that's... Well, I don't know. There's a years. dozen of them now. They make them yeah. all over the place. Right. I mean, they're everywhere. You know, you can attach that to your barrel. Well, aren't those two-handed guns? So here's the thing. I'm glad this, you know, isn't the case, but why in the world is it that you have to go to federal prison if you have a vertical foregrip on your handgun when vertical isn't the issue? Foregrip is the issue, but yet it's okay to have a a horizontal one, an angled one. And as a matter of fact, you can even have a vertical one if it's attached to your magazine well. I have a better just, question, and this is just from a guy who's never been at ATF. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a specialist in much of anything other than raising my kids. I've done a pretty good job at that, but that's got nothing to do with any of this. And that's worth a lot. And here's my, yeah, and here's my question. Why does it matter in the first place? If I have a firearm that I have not committed a crime with, and I'm not a criminal, I'm a law-abiding American citizen, then why does it matter whether I have a vertical foregrip, a horizontal foregrip, a, a, an angled foregrip, a star-shaped foregrip, a box of foregrip, a mythical foregrip, two foregrips, eight foregrips, no foregrips, or all the foregrips I want? I haven't I committed a crime with, with this more. stupid thing, so what is the difference? That just seems to me to be... And huge infringement on the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, first of all, and a huge waste of law enforcement time. I completely agree with you, Joel. I could not be more pro-Second Amendment. I know Trust that. Trust me. <laughs> I know you. I could not I be that. more pro-Second Amendment. The reason that we comment on these issues is uh, because at the end of 35 years of law enforcement and being heavily into you know the firearm thing, I saw that it's ludicrous how little law enforcement people know about firearms. Now, I love police officers. I mean, nothing against law enforcement. Me too. Hatton, but, uh, if 75% of my friends are cops, my father was a deputy sheriff. I mean, I, you know, so yeah, I'm with you. I'm right there. Yeah. With you. yeah. My dad was a cop. My mother was a police dispatcher. Um, there is 
In fact, hold on. Don't move. Uh, let's see. One of my students gave me this. San Diego County Sheriff's there Department you go. pin. Now, that's an old one. I looked at it. That's from back from when Sheriff Roach was sheriff. That was amazing. Uh, I have another student who is Fantastic. retired uh, from the Uniform Secret Service. He gave me that. I have another student who uh, was on the Secret Service protective detail for President Ford. He's older than you and me. That's nice to know a guy that's older than me. And he gave me that. There's a lot of those. So, you know, yeah, I don't have, I, I have no Fantastic. issues with law enforcement. I support them. So there you are. And I have well, the their pins that, laying around. There you go. So. Those are great. Now, yeah. the fact that police departments don't teach police officers much about firearms and there's so much confusion. Uh, and the fact that ATF doesn't teach the gun industry about firearms. Nobody teaches civilians about firearms. There's so much confusion. There's so much misinformation. I mean, where do you get your information? If you write to ATF, uh, it takes a year to get an answer, and you might get two different answers. You know, you certainly don't want to rely on the forums or the gun shows. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. So I, uh, having co-wrote the lesson plans for the ATF Academy, you know, no matter what your position is on ATF, no matter how much you might hate them, um, it at least gave me a background to or how much you may love them whatever but it, it gave me a background to be able to write a course of training where you know our mission statement is look the buck stops here if you come to us you get this training you will maybe not agree with what's going on out there but you will at least be able to sort it out and know how to avoid getting yourself in trouble by listening to that information so we're trying to raise the bar on stuff and uh, that's where you know we find these disconnects that result in cases like these. I think the other problem, too, is that when citizens find themselves having to defend themselves against these kinds of things, there are not, a, in my experience, there are not a whole lot of attorneys that specialize in firearms-type issues. That's a, They might be defense attorneys in this area, and then they have to go research that. And it's such a convoluted mess of laws that if you're not an expert, that's really hard to navigate that. And unfortunately, the expert attorney who could do that well, that dude's 2500 bucks an hour, and not everybody can afford to pay that guy. So I think that's part of the problem as well. So it's good um, that you're doing this. Are you finding yourself educating attorneys as well on a regular basis or mostly law enforcement? No. It's about 50-50. Our training is mostly law enforcement people, but our legal consulting business is all attorneys. Uh, you know, the phone rings nearly every day from another attorney someplace in the country saying, hey, heard about you guys, got a case. They run it by us. And uh, we tell them, well, you know, there's this and that. Did you? A lot of times they just want to know, um, you know, hey, I have a client and he was arrested for having a silencer, but he says this thing is a solvent trap. Or, you know, he had this yeah. vertical foregrip on his pistol. And why is that, you know, so you have to educate them um, and show them these disconnects. And uh, can I, Dan, just for the purpose of educating the populace, of which I am one. Uh, people think I know a lot of stuff, so they send me emails. Hey, do you have an answer to this? I don't know, squat. I'm just a guy that has a YouTube channel and asks people who know, like you. Is it possible for a, a law-abiding citizen to take your courses or take courses from you to learn this stuff? Certainly, it's open to everyone. We, uh, when we, you can either take it online or you can attend one of our seminars, a live seminar. I mean, if you look at the uh, calendar on our website, we have seminars coming up at the, now most of them are held at police departments, but most of those are still open to civilians and gun industry people. Uh, we have Chicago Police Department coming up the 1st of April. We have uh, Seattle Police Department coming up in May. We have one going on as we speak right now in Allen, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas. One of our instructors is out there doing day one of a three-day seminar. Uh, we teach them all over the country and we have for years. Uh, we tell everyone who's going to attend one of those that the information, there's nothing secret, nothing classified, but you uh, are going to be handling firearms in the class to illustrate what we teach. So the classes are not open to anyone who is prohibited from possessing a firearm. If you can't go buy a gun because you uh, have done something in the past, then you cannot attend our training. Uh, it would be illegal for you to touch a gun in the classroom. Um, 
on the other hand, you know, if you made a mistake in the past and you've already paid for it, you can still get this knowledge by taking the courses online. Uh, you know, afterwards, you still won't be able to possess a firearm, but you will know what the law says, what the classifications are, et cetera, so you can avoid any further trouble. Yeah, not a good idea to show up to the cop shop to handle firearms for a live no. class if you're a prohibited person. That that just doesn't <laughs> that doesn't strike me as a really bueno idea. Dan, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. Uh, thank you're you. you're a tremendous asset, uh, and, and and you're just a good guy. And <laughs> I've always liked you anyway. So there you are. And I'm not going to tell anybody about you. So a little inside baseball here. I'm going to say it. I'm just going to say it. So you were on the Leo roundtable the other day, and they gave you all kinds of gas about the, <laughs> the, the roof in your RV. So we're setting up the cameras here, Dan and I, and he says, well, I got to do this tight shot. And I said, why? He said, well, because the roof in my RV has this mirror or window or whatever it is, and they gave me a lot of grief about it. I promised you I wouldn't give you grief about it. Dan is traveling, so he's actually been kind enough to stop his traveling in his RV and actually do this. So I just want to tell you, your roof is fine, brother. Don't worry about it. And uh, it actually looks rather nice, and I won't give you any grief about it. But thank, I want to thank you for taking time out of your travels from your RV. If, if you, you may have heard some noises in the background during this interview, and it was vehicles going by because he's sitting in his RV. So that's what the rumbling sound was. So there you go, a little background baseball for you. Dan, thank you so very much for all of your hard work and everything you do. And thank you again for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Joel. I will put links to Dan's website uh, in the description so that you can check that out. And if you have questions about this kind of stuff, I would say direct them to him, not me, because I don't know the answers. And certainly, if you have the opportunity, I would at minimum, I would take one of his courses online. And if you can actually attend a live one, that would be terrific. Thank you again for watching and for all of your support. I really do appreciate it. Wherever you go, whatever you do, please. Be safe.